Hello, I'm Ray Parker. I'm one of the teachers at Rankin First Christian Church, and I'm teaching the International Sunday School series, and this today begins the fall quarter. And this fall, this whole fall quarter is love for one another, and it's taken from a number of, number of different places in the Bible. First, we start off in the book of Genesis with the story of Joseph in the first four lessons deal with Joseph and the, the relationship he has with his father and all those brothers. And then, of course, later on in Egypt. So there's four lessons dealing with that. Then we move to uh, another lesson from the Old Testament about uh, Jonathan and David. And then we move to the New Testament for the other, the other times. But before we get into the, the lesson for the day proper, I need to go back and fill you in on a little bit of background that we have for these lessons. Because sometimes we don't know the, the real historical background of these stories. Uh, Joseph is third generation of uh, Abraham's family. And as we go back and look at all three of these generations, we see that there were a lot of uh, problems in the home. We use a, a term here in America, particularly in the South, home sweet home. That would not be a term that would be used in relationship to Abraham's or Isaac's or Jacob's home because there was conflict. There was conflict in Abraham's home with Sarah and uh, the concubine and then with Ishmael and Isaac. So there was turmoil there always. Then we get down to Isaac's family when he re married Rebecca. Then she had twin boys. Uh, and again, there was conflicts because Isaac pulled toward the older uh, Esau and Rebecca pulled toward the younger Jacob. And therefore there was conflict be between the two boys and similarly in the household, because we know that time when Isaac was ready to give the blessings on the eldest that Rebecca set in and they made the, made the little switcheroo there that Jacob got the blessing and, then had to flee because Esau was going to kill him. So as Jacob goes to Patamara and back to Rebekah's home and her brother, then immediately Jacob fell in love with one of Laban's daughters, uh, Rachel, and was willing to work seven years for her. But when the time came for the marriage to take place, then uh, they snook at him again. And the next morning he, he woke up with the wrong sister, and that started a long, lengthy process of turmoil that lasted decades. So we pick up in our lesson today with our first lesson on Joseph. They are back in Canaan. And there was a lot of turmoil involved in that because he showed uh, special treatment to Rachel and her two and her boys and that return. And then later on, this continued to escalate as he favored Joseph over the other sons and showed him special attention. And this is what our lesson is about today. So before we get into the text itself, let's pause for prayer. God, we come to you to thank you for your goodness, your grace. We thank you for all the love you give to us on a daily basis. And as we look at this, as we look at scriptures throughout the scriptures, we realize there was a lot of disharmony in, in people's lives as there's still disharmony in families. There's disharmony in, uh, in, in our nation. There's disharmony in so many things. And we know that sin is the cause. Satan would like to destroy and conquer. Father, we pray that we might understand better your word, your will, and surrender to that. Father, guide us as we look at this lesson on Joseph in your son's name. Amen. So we pick up our text with Genesis chapter 37. If you have a book, if you will open to that point, 
If not, then open your Bibles to Genesis 37, and they will, we'll jump one passage later on in the text. But the first several verses come straight from uh, chapter 37, beginning at verse 2. And it says this. This is the account of Jacob's family line. This phrase, this is the account of, appears seven or eight times uh, through the early Genesis record. And this seems to be the last time this is used. But it seems that ever who recorded Genesis, and we suppose it to be Moses, recorded these different events in, in sort of like chapters. And so this is a way of introducing this uh, this last chapter in this in the patriarch's line here. Verse 2b, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers. Joseph is 17, teenager. He seems to be, at, well, we know he is going to be the favorite son of all of the sons and one daughter. And he seems to be put in a position of learning the family business all about it, which was shepherding. And he is sent on various and sundry uh, trips to check out what's going on in the, in the family business. So this particular time, he goes out with them. And then the rest of the verse says, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. So these four sons, two each by these concubines, uh, were out tending flocks somewhere uh, seemingly close to where the compound was, family compound was at this time. And whatever they did, it did not suit Joseph. And so he goes home and tattles on what they'd done. Now, what they'd done, we don't really know, whether they took a few animals and sold them off to the Israelites or the tribes as they were going through, or whether they were just negligent about the family business. We don't know what it was, but it was something that, that Joseph thought his father needed to know, and so he goes home and tells him about it. That was not a good move, at least from uh, the family standpoint, but it was already done. Verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. Notice we get a name change here. When Jacob had come back to Canaan with his family, he wrestled with the angel that night in crossing the Jabbok River, and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And we will find both of these names used interchangeably throughout the rest of the scriptures. That sometimes he'd be called Jacob, sometimes he'd be called Israel. Jacob is God-given family, his, his family name, and Israel, his God-given name. So both of these names are used. The is, I-S, it stands for uh, Israel, no, excuse me, the E-L on the end of Israel it, uh, means God, and so it was a name that God gave him in relationship to himself. Something else we see in this verse that we find that Jacob makes for Joseph this or, or, ornate uh, robe, we normally call it the, the multicolored robe. And of course, movies and other things have been made on that. But whatever kind of robe it was, it was something that distinguished Joseph from all the other brothers, something that showed his uh, father's partiality to him and that, uh, that great concern and love he had for this son. So Jacob shows this greater love and so the scripture says more than um, that comparison between the other boys and Joseph is shown here now we as humans can understand that special treatment uh, Jacob if you go back and think about it Jacob never wanted Leah he never wanted these uh, concubines that was not in his plan uh, but his father-in-law tricked him and so he was stuck with the situation and though I guess he could have never gone into Leah again and just left her alone, he does not. Uh, and so all of this just continues to build more tension through the, through the years. And so in, in verse 4, 
when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Can you imagine the turmoil in the compound with all of these 12 sons and, of course, the one girl, uh, Diana? And Leah seems to be still alive. And Bilha and Zipha still seems to be alive because Rachel's the only one died when uh, Ray, uh, when uh, Benjamin was born. The, the, the turmoil inside this compound when the brothers and possibly those other three women hated Joseph because of how uh, Jacob was treating him. So the turmoil involved in this whole affair is very paramount in this. Verse 5 picks up uh, another, uh, another segment of the story. Joseph had a dream. When he had told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He had a dream. Now, we know that God uses dreams throughout the Bible to reveal things. Sometimes they're to reveal things about himself. Sometimes they're dreams to reveal things that's what's going to take place in the people's lives. And so this seems to be the reason. But here, Joseph, as a 17-year-old, does not necessarily understand the ramifications of it. He just centers on what the dream is. And so, therefore, he decides to tell the brothers. So the dream, six and seven. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain in the field, when suddenly my sheep rose up, rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to to understand uh, that Joseph understood that he was going to become leader of this family uh, compound someday in time. And this was his interpretation of dream, or at least that's what he thought. And the brothers caught on to this pretty fast that Joseph was asserting himself uh, as Jacob had already indicated. He, he chose him above the others. And so this just caused more hateful attitude from the brothers toward uh, Joseph. It didn't endear him to them at all. Verse 8, his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what they had said. Reigning over the brothers. We already know from the from Genesis a little bit that we've already uh, occurred that the eldest child becomes the primary principal owner of the estate. And all the others are either sent off or given uh, certain portions, as was Ishmael earlier on with Abraham. And uh, Jacob, of course, inherited and uh, the, the brother had to leave. So uh, this idea is there and they know that. So they think and they interpret it rightly that Joseph is going to become the leader of the pack. Nine. And then he had another dream. And he told his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. So the second dream becomes more intense. Instead of just the brothers, it indicates mom and daddy and the other two women are all going to bow down to Joseph. Now we know long term because the rest of scripture is what God is revealing. And this does take place. But at this point in time, with Joseph and with these brothers and even with Jacob, does not understand the long-term meaning of, of these dreams. So they, so they interpret it as, again, that his arrogance, his dominance is going to take place. So the, so the next verse in verse 10, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Jacob understood. And he recognizes that this is the intent of Joseph, though I think maybe innocently in, in a way, but yet he still tells it.
verse 11. His brothers were jealous of him. Jealousy, strong motive here. Uh, they had already hated him. And so jealousy is even more intense than this. And so seemingly from this point on, they began to plot. They began to reason out how are they going to get rid of this, this interloper, at least, uh, in their lives and the life of the whole compound. And so the verse Verse 11b, the end of that other verse, gives us a little bit of insight, at least into Jacob's thoughts. But his father kept the matter in mind. Remember when Jesus was born and all those events took place uh, before the birth, the announcements to her and to Joseph, and then the birth things, and then the fleeing and all of this, that we have this phrase about Mary, and she kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Joe, uh, Jacob here indicates, the scriptures indicate that Jacob is going to remember these things, though, though short term, he would not understand. Uh, this did not uh, happen until the fulfillment uh, years later when he does go before Joseph in Egypt. But he had remembered these things. And so we have them uh, written down for us to know as well. Now in our text, we skip from verse 11 all the way down to verse 23, and there's a lot of things that's happened in between these things. The brothers, seemingly all of them this time, uh, takes their flocks north from uh, uh, lower uh, Canaan all the way up to Dothan, which seems to be 50, 60 miles uh, north. And remember... Canaan is pretty arid, although we have later on in, in the extra story about the land flowing with milk and honey, it's still an arid land. And with the amount of uh, grazing uh, facilities and the amount of sheep and goats that this man seems to have had, they had to be on the move. And so this continual moving uh, from pasture to pasture to pasture to pasture, open great range of land, and remember, there are Canaanites in this land as well, a bunch of Canaanites. And so they are trying to stay out of, uh, of other people's way. And so they continue to move. And by this time, they moved a long way off. In fact, they are very near the caravan route from uh, uh, Babylon and all those countries east down to Egypt. So this is where they are. And so Jacob sends Joseph. On a trip, he takes food, he takes things with him. And it seems in this text in between here, uh, Joseph has done a lot of wandering around trying to find these brothers and where the where their flocks are. And he finally gets word that they are in Dothan. And so he arrives in Dothan. Well, as he's coming toward them, they recognize him. Guess from what? That ornate robe. He's still wearing it. And so they recognize him, and, and, and probably this plotting was already in their hearts, but they, they began to put two and two together here and said, we will kill him and uh, tell our father the wild animals has done it, and we will be rid of this, this interloper. That was their plan. But Reuben, one of the older boys, uh, did not want to go with the plan. And so he talked the brothers into, instead of killing him outright, to throw him in one of the dry cisterns that were in the area, a well, so that he could come back later on and pull him out and restore him back to his father because he knew this would kill his father uh, with the fact that uh, Joseph was dead. So he tossed his brother in to put him in the cistern. Well, he's in the cistern. And then Isaac picks up in verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into a cistern. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. So as Reuben is gone, these, this caravan comes by, and so the brothers take up another plan. And still a killing him, as Reuben has talked about of doing, they say, we will sell him into Egypt. We will be rid of him forever because once he is sold as a slave, they thought they would never see him again. They decided to take the robe and 
tear it somehow or another and put animal's blood on it and carry it back to their father and say that this is what they found and Joseph is gone. That was the plan, and this is how they carried it out. Now, we have two words in this verse 28. We, we call them Midianites, and we call them Ishmaelites. We know from previous history that the Ishmaelites and the Midianites are both descendants of Abraham. One by, uh, one by, uh, yeah, Ishmael, uh, and the others by Esau. So they were related. And commentators are are, are concerned about which one, which one did they sell into one of these, and the other one uh, was a middleman, and the other one sold them into Egypt. It really doesn't matter. Uh, he was taken. He was sold here for 20 shekels. And uh, he was on his way to, to slavery. And other lessons will pick up the rest of the story and what uh, Joseph done. But as we bring this lesson to a close here, let's take a few moments to consider things. This episode... It's not so unusual still in families, is it? You know, we still have trauma in families. We have blended family. We have mixed families. We have all sorts of families. And oftentimes in these blended and mixed families, uh, we, have, we have your children and my children and our children. And there's a lot of turmoil in them. Sometimes there's not. A lot of times there is. And so this same thing is taking place in families today. Our lesson title was love one another. And this is the goal. This is the this is what God wants us to do. This is what we really down deep want to do. But oftentimes other things come involved. Tempers get out of hand. Uh, feelings get out of hand. And therefore we have conflict and oftentimes a, a lot of lack of love in families. But with Joseph, and this story, we know God is behind the scenes. We know that God is behind the scenes always in our lives. And if we're faithful to him, things are going to happen. A lot of times we don't understand why they're happening or, or when they're happening, but they happen. And if we're faithful to him, we know God is working behind the scenes and works things out. We know that passage in Romans 8, uh, God all works those things out for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. But we don't normally understand that in the short term. Neither did Jacob or Joseph or these brothers understand that in the short term. It took decades and decades for this thing to play out. And it took four centuries for it to totally play out. And, and uh, these, this family was liberated from slavery. Now, I don't think they lived in slavery for 400 years. Uh, seemingly the first couple of hundred years or so was, was bountiful. They grew and multiplied and, and, and basically were rich. But times changed and hard times did come because uh, of events. And yet God was still behind the scenes working things out. And so Joseph's uh, grandfather, this whole turmoil started with him and it went down through the generations and generations and generations. And it still takes place in family generations as well, unless somehow we come to a knowledge through Jesus Christ and change the way things are done. So God wants us to care about one another, to love one another, to care about our families, to care about others. And this is his goal for us through Jesus Christ. May we pray. Father, again, this morning, may we take these words and understand them as in its biblical context, but also understand that these same tragic things take place in our lives, in our families' lives today. And we pray that your spirit may draw us to you, that we may find rest and we find comfort in your grace and in your son. In his name, amen.